you're leading MIT's effort to design Spark, yeah. a compact, high field, DT burning tokamak. How does it work? Yeah. What is it? What's the motivation? Uh, what's the design? What are the ideas behind yeah. it? Yeah, at its heart, it's exactly the same concept as ITER. So it's basically a configuration of electromagnets. It's arranged in the shape of a donut. And within that, we will do we would do the same thing that happens in all the other tokamaks and including in ITER and in this one, is that namely you put in gas, make it into a plasma, you heat it up, it gets to about 100 million degrees. The differentiator in Spark is that we use the actual deuterium tritium fuel. And because of the access to very high magnetic fields, it's in a very compact space. It's very, very small. What do I mean by small? So it's 40 times smaller in volume than ITER. Mm -hmm. But it uses exactly the same physical principles. So this comes from the high magnetic field. So in the end, like what is, why does this matter? What it does is it does those things and it should get to the point where it's producing over 100 million watts of fusion power but remember, it's 40 times smaller. So ITER was 500 megawatts. Technically, our, our design is around 150 megawatts. So it's only about a factor of three difference, despite being 40 times smaller. Um, and we see um, QP large, order of 10 or something like this. At that, at that, at that state is very important scientifically because this is basically matches what ITER is looking to do. The plasma is dominated by its own heating. It's very, very important. And it does that for about 10 seconds. And the reason it's for 10 seconds is that in terms of that, that basically allows everything to settle in terms of the fusion in the plasma equilibrium. Everything is nice and settled. So you know, you have seen the physical state at which you would expect a power plant to operate basically for, for, for magnetic fusion. Like, wow, right? Mm -hmm. But it's more than that. <laughs> And it's more than that, it's because about who's building it and why and how it's being financed. Mm -hmm. um, so that scientific pathway was made possible by the fact that we had access to a next generation of, of magnet technology. So to explain this real quick, why do we call it, you, you, you said it in the words, a superconducting magnet. What does this mean? Superconducting magnet means that the materials which are in the electromagnet have no electrical resistance. Therefore, when the electric current is put into it, the current goes around unimpeded. Mm -hmm. So it could basically keep going around and around, you know, technically for infinity. And what that means, or for eternity, and what that means is that the, um, when you energize these large electromagnets, they're, they're using basically zero uh, electrical power to maintain them. Whereas if you would do this in a normal wire, like copper, you basically make an enormous toaster oven that's consuming enormous amounts of power and getting hot, which is a problem. That was the technical breakthrough that was realized by myself and at the time my students and postdocs and colleagues at MIT was that we we saw the advent of this new this new superconducting material, which would allow us to access much higher magnetic fields. It was basically the next generation of the technology, and. Um, and it was quite disruptive to fusion, that namely what it would allow that if we could if we could get to this point where we can make the round 20 Tesla, we knew by the rules of Tokamax that this is going to be, is going to allow us to gr vastly shrink like the sizes of these devices. So it wouldn't take, um, although, although it's a worthy goal, it wouldn't take a seven nation international, you know, treaty basically to build it. You could build it with a company and a university. So same kind of design, but now using the superconducting yeah. magnets. Yeah. And if, in fact, if you look at it, it's like, it's, if you just I expand the size of it, they're like, they look almost identical to each other because it's based on the, and actually that comes for a reason, by the way, is that it also looks like a bigger version of the tokamak that we ran at MIT for 20 years, mm -hmm. where we established the scientific benefits, in fact, of these higher magnetic fields. So that's the pathway that we're on. So we say, so what does this mean? The context is different because it was made, because it's primarily being made by a, a, a private sector company spun out of MIT mm -hmm. because the way that it raised money and the purpose of the entity which is there is to make commercial fusion power plants, not just to make a scientific experiment. This is actually why we have, um, that's why we have a partnership 
right, is that our purpose at MIT is not to commercialize directly, but boy, do we want to advance the technology and the science that comes along with this, and, the, and that's the reason we're sort of doing it together. So it's MIT and Commonwealth Fusion yeah. Systems. Yeah. So what's what's interesting to say about financing, and this seems like from a scientific perspective, maybe not an interesting topic, but it's perhaps an extremely interesting topic. I mean, you can just look at the tension between uh, SpaceX and NASA, for example. Yes. It's just clear that there's different financing mechanisms can actually significantly accelerate the development of science and engineering. It's great that you brought that up. We use several historic analogs, and one of them is around SpaceX, which is an appropriate one because space, you know, putting things into orbit has a just a, has a minimum size to it and integrated technological complexity and budget and things like this. So, you know, our point when we were like talking about starting like a fusion commercialization, you know, company, people look at you like, like, isn't this still really just a science experiment, you know? But our, one of the things that we pointed to was SpaceX to say, well, tell me like 25 years ago, how many people would have voted that, you know, the, the, the leading entity on the planet to put things into orbit, it's a private company. Yeah. People would have thought you were not so, right? It's like... And what is interesting about SpaceX is that it, it proved it's more than actually just financing. It's really the purpose of the organization. So the purpose of a government, and I'm not against public finance or anything like that, but the purpose of a public entity like, like NASA correctly you know, speaks to the political, because the, the cost comes from the political you know, uh, assembly that is there, and, and, and I guess from us eventually as well too, but its purpose wasn't about like making a commercial product. It, it, it's about fundamental discovery and so forth, which is all, which is all really great. It's like, why did, why did SpaceX, it's interesting, like, why did SpaceX succeed so well is because the idea was, it's like the, the focus that comes in the idea that you're going to relentlessly like reduce cost and increase efficiency is a drive that comes from the commercial aspect of it, right? And this also then changes um, the people in the teams which are doing it as well too. And in fact, trickles throughout the whole thing because the purpose isn't while you're while you're advancing things like it's really good that we can put things in orbit a lot less more cheaply. Like it advances science, which is an interesting synergy, right? And it's the same thing. That, that, that we think is going to happen in fusion, that namely, these this is a bootstrap effect that actually, that when you start to push yourself to think about near-term commercialization, it like be, uh, allows the science to, to, to get in hand faster, which then allows the commercialization to go faster and, da, 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 and up we go. By the way, we've seen this also in another, like, again, it's a, you, you have to watch out with, with analogies because they only you know, can go so far, but like biotech is another one. Like you look at the hu human genome project, which was, it, it's sort of like, it's it, to me, that's like the, like mapping the human genome is like, like that we can make net energy from fusion. Like it's one of those, like in your drawer that you go, this is a significant achievement by humanity, right? In this century. And there's the human genome project, fully government funded. It's going to take 20, 25 years because we basically know the technology. We're just going to be really diligent, keep going, da, 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 da. And then all of a sudden, what comes along? Disruptive technology, <laughs> right? You can sequence, you, you know, shotgun sequencing and, and, uh, and computer, you know, recognition patterns. And basically, oh, I can do this 100 times faster. Like, wow, right? And so, so that's really the... Um, uh, you know, to me, that the story about why we started, why we launched Commonwealth Fusion Systems was more than just about another source of funding, which it is a different source of funding because it comes, from, it's also a different purpose, which is very important. But there's also something about a uh, mechanism that creates culture. So mm -hmm. giving power to like a, a young student, ambitious student to have a tremendous impact on the progress of nuclear fusion. Yeah creates a culture that actually makes progress more aggressively. Like like you said, when seven nations collaborate, it gives more incentive to the bureaucracy to slow things down, to kind of have, let's have first have a discussion and certainly don't give voice to the young ambitious minds that are really pushing stuff forward. Yeah. And there's something about uh, like the private sector that rewards, encourages, inspires young minds 
to say uh, in the most beautiful of ways, F you to the, to the, <laughs> it to, is, it to, is to the boss. Yeah. And to yeah, say yeah, like, yeah. we'll make it faster, we'll make it simpler, we'll yeah, make it yeah. better, we'll make it cheaper. Yeah. And sometimes that brashness doesn't bear out. You know, that's an aspect that, that you just take a different risk profile as well too. But you're, you're right. It's this, you know, of the, I mean, it was interesting. Our, our, our own trajectory at the, at the fusion center was, like we were pushed into this place by necessity as well too, because I told you we have and we had operated for a long time uh, a tokamak at at uh, on the MIT campus, achieve these world records like a hundred million degree plasma and stuff. It's like wow, this is fantastic. But you know, somewhat ironically, I have to say is that it was like oh, but we're not. This isn't the future of fusion anymore. Like we're not. We're just going to stop with small projects because it's too small, right? Mm -hmm. So we should need. We need to really move on to these much bigger projects because that's really the future of fusion. And so it was defunded, um, and this basically put at risk like like we were going to essentially lose MIT in the ecosystem, mm -hmm. really of fusion, both from the research, but also clearly important from the educational part of it. So we, you know, we pushed back against this. We got a lifeline. We were able to go, and it was in this, it was in this time scale that we basically came up with this idea. It's like, we should do this. And in the end, it was all of those, the, the people who were in the C-level of the company were all literally students who got caught in that. They were PhD students mm -hmm. at the time. So you talk about enabling another generation. It's like, yeah, there you go, right? <laughs> so Spark gave... Uh... A lifeline, yeah. a lifeline, uh, a yeah. fuel to the the, the future yeah. center at MIT that it continues. But it's way more than that. It was it wasn't just about like surviving for the sake of surviving. Yeah. It was like, in the end, for me, it became like this. I remember the moment. You, know, you talk about these moments as a scientist, and we were just like we were working so hard about figuring out like, does this really would this really work? Like, and it's it's complex. Like, does the magnet work? Does the interaction with the plasma work? Does all these things work? And it was just a grind, push, 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 push. And I remember the moment because I was sitting in my office in, in Brookline and, 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 and there was just like, I read like, and I was in, I don't know, whatever, the 20 or 40th slide or something into it. And it was sort of that moment, like it just came together. And I like, I, I got, I couldn't even sit down because all it was just like, my wife was like, why are you walking around the apartment like this? Like, I just couldn't, she, I said, it's going to work. Like it's going to work. Like holy cow. That that moment of realization is like kind of amazing. But it also brings the responsibility of making it work as well. Yeah, how do you make it work? Yeah. So you, you mean like that magic realization that you can have this uh this modern uh magnet technology and you can actually like why do we need to work with Eater? We can do it here. Yeah, yeah. But it's interesting that Eater is um, that one one of one of the reasons that like at, we started with a group of six of us at, at MIT, and then ex once we got some funding through the through the establishment of the company, it became a slightly larger. Mm -hmm. But in the end, we had a re rather small team. Like this was like a team of you know, order of like twenty to twenty five people design Spark in like a like about two years. Right? How does that happen? Well, we're clever, but you have to give Eater its due here as well too. That. Again, this is an aspect always of the bootstrap up. Like I go back to the, the human genome project. So modern day genomics would not be possible without the underlying basis that came from setting that mm -hmm. up. It had to be there. It had to be curiosity driven public program. It's the same with Eater, but we because we had the tools that were there to understand Eater, we also had the tools to understand Spark. So we we parlayed those in an extremely powerful way to be able to tell us about what was going to happen. So these things are never simple, right? It's like people look at this, go, oh, this means we should, like, should we really have a public-based program about fusion or should we have it all in the private? It's like, no, no, the answer is neither way because in all these complex technologies, you have to keep pushing on all the fronts to actually get it there.